Welcome back to the whole Bible series. This week we are in the book of Hosea. Hosea is part of the prophets in the Tanakh. In our Bible, Hosea is part of the Old Testament prophets. The purpose in, of the book of Hosea is to warn the people in the northern kingdom of Israel of the impending Assyrian exile. Demonstrate God's steadfast love for his people through his own marriage to Gomer and call the people to repentance and covenant renewal. For more information, go back to episode 27. Hosea is the 28th book of the Bible and the first book of the Minor Prophets. Both Hebrew and Christian tradition hold that Hosea was written by the prophet Hosea. The opening verse of the book identifies Hosea as the source for the prophecy, whether he physically wrote it or it was transcribed by another. His ministry to the northern kingdom likely ended when Shalmaneser V of Assyria invaded Israel, sacked Samaria, and deported more than 27,000 Israelites to Mesopotamia, circa 722 BC. Hosea's message was probably put in writing sometime between the date of King Menahem's payment of tribute to Kiglath Pileser III of Assyria, circa 739 BC, and the fall of Samaria in 722 BC, since Hosea does not mention that event. <clears throat> Based on the kings that Hosea associated with his ministry, Hosea's ministry probably fell between 753 BC and 687 BC. The ESV Study Bible says that the prophet's ministry was probably not that long, 66 years, though a 35-year ministry is possible. The significant feature is that he ministered during the latter half of the 8th century BC. For more information, again, go back to episode 27. Themes in Hosea. We have Hosea's marriage, Baalism, and covenant violation. As to prophecy versus eschatology, eschatology is not explicit in the book of Hosea. There is only mention of God restoring Israel at some future point. Since the northern kingdom of Israel was never fully restored, this likely refers to an end time event. Because of this, we give the book of Hosea an eschatology rating of one out of four horsemen. Hosea is broken into three sections. Here's Hosea on the timeline that we've been using. And here is Hosea in context to the kings who lived and ruled during the, his time that he was here on earth. <clears throat> and so we come to the first section. Chapter 1, verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Just a note here at the bottom, the name Beeri is only mentioned twice in the Bible, but for separate people. We know next to nothing about Hosea's father or his lineage. Hosea is the only writing prophet who was raised in and ministered to the northern kingdom of Israel. Hosea's northern setting joined his unique call experience to make his ministry and message stand out from all other prophets. This comes from the Lexham Bible Dictionary. We'll move on to the second section, Hosea's marriage to Gomer. Chapter 1, verse 2. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and he took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. She conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, call her name, no mercy, 
for I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all, but I will have mercy on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God, or by Yahweh their God. I will not save them by bow, or by sword, or by war, or by horses, or by horsemen. <clears throat> Let's pause there. So we have Hosea, who goes and marries a prostitute, and he has two children at this point. Uh, God tells him to name his first Jezreel and the second no mercy. So let's go through what those actually mean. So to the left here, you'll notice that in 2 Kings 9 and 10, Jehu is anointed king by Yahweh through Elisha. He goes on to kill Jezebel, the king of Judah, and the entire reigning house of Ahab. This takes place in the Jezreel Valley. So if you remember the story, uh, Jehu becomes anointed. He goes and he kills Jezebel. She's thrown down and, you know, the dogs pick at her. Uh, and also he kills the king of Judah and he kills the king of Israel and usurps the power in Israel by killing the entire house of King Ahab. And so this is what God is referring to here. Uh, you'll see that the Expositor's Bible Commentary here at the bottom says, the monarchy of Hosea's day will suffer the same fate as that suffered by the house of Ahab and others. It will be eliminated by divine judgment. So here in calling Hosea's son Jezreel, uh, Yahweh is pointing to the fact that Israel will be ended. It will be eliminated by divine judgment. As to the second child, the second child received the name Lo Ruhama, which means she is not loved. Here we see in this translation, it says no mercy. Her name indicated that the Lord's love for Israel would be cut off for a time. Ruhama, from the verb Reham, describes tender feelings of compassion, such as those expressed by a parent for a child or by a man for his younger brother. So uh, here, God is saying that uh, one who is not loved, this, this child who represents Israel, uh, Israel is no longer going to be loved by God. Uh, and here in this translation, it says that he's not going to show them mercy anymore. <clears throat> uh, that came from the, excuse me, the Bible knowledge commentary. <clears throat> we'll move on to verse 8. When she had weaned no mercy she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, call his name, not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. And the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head. And they shall go up from the land, for the great shall be the day of Jezreel. Okay, so we now have a third child. So let's go and see what the Bible Knowledge Commentary says about this. On the left, the third child, a son, was named Lo-Ami, which means not my people. In the ancient covenant formula, God declared, I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. But now that relationship was to be severed. The last cause, excuse me, the last clause of Hosea 1 9, I am not your God, is literally, I am, excuse me, and I, not I am, to you. All right. So if you remember back in, uh, in the desert with Moses, God reveals himself, Yahweh reveals himself as I am. And here he's saying in Hosea that the people of Israel, represented by Hosea's third child, that he will not be I am to them anymore, that he will no longer be their God, and they will no longer be his people. One more note here at the bottom, and you'll see the area highlighted in, in purple. Uh, the reunification of the two kingdoms under one head is a pointer to the Davidic covenant. Divided since 931 BC and in conflict intermittently over the years, the southern and northern kingdoms will again be reconciled. 
once again from the expositor's Bible commentary. So we have three children who represent Israel, and God is making it very clear to the people through Hosea and his the lives of his children that he is going to cut them off, that he's finally going to sever their relationship. But yet there's some hope at the end of the, this section. And he says that the children of Judah and the children of Israel will come back together at some point in the future. <clears throat> Chapter 2. Say to your brothers, you are my people. And to your sisters, you have received mercy. Plead with your mother. Plead, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. That she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and make her as in the day she was born, and make her like a wilderness, and make her like a parched land, and kill her with thirst. Upon her children I will have no mercy, because they are children of whoredom, for the mother has played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers, who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, I will hedge up a, her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her, so that she cannot find her paths. Quick pause here uh, as we come into chapter two. Uh, we've been talking about Hosea and his wife Gomer, the prostitute Gomer. Um, and so it would be natural for you to think that we're talking here uh, as a prostitute. Uh, of, of Gomer still, uh, where it says, plead with your mother. But in fact, notice that Yahweh is still addressing Hosea. So the mother here is, that's referred to is not actually Gomer, but mother Israel. If you remember that Israel is the bride of Yahweh. And so Yahweh is addressing Hosea and asking him to plead with Israel. Verse 7. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but she shall not find them. And she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me than then than now. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the green, the wine, and the oil, and who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Therefore, I will take back my grain in its time and my wine in its season, and I will take away my wool and my flax, which were there to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. And I will put an end to all her mirth, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and her appointed feasts. There's a note here to the left. Uh, just a reminder of who Baal is. We've talked about him in the past. This is the Canaanite storm god and the bringer of rain. He's the chief of the Canaanite pantheon. He is the chief god that the Canaanites worship. And therefore, uh, Israel often hoard herself by chasing after Baal rather than Yahweh. Verse 12. And I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees, of which she said, these are my wages, which my lovers have given me. I will make them a forest, and the beast of the field shall devour them. And I will punish her for the feast days of the balls, when she burned offerings to them, and adorned herself with the ring and jewelry, and went after her lovers and forgot me, declares the Lord Yahweh. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, and bring her into the wilderness, and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her vineyards, and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. And there she shall answer, as in the day of her youth, as in the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. So note here to the left, from the Bible Knowledge Commentary, the Lord promised to initiate reconciliation with his wayward wife by alluring her. Allure refers here to tender, even seductive speech. Elsewhere, the term, excuse me, the term describes a man's seduction of a virgin and a lover's attempt to entice a man into divulging confidential information. The Lord said that he would lead Israel into the desert where she will be completely separated from past lovers and, it will, and will be able to concentrate totally on his advances. 
So you see here in chapter two that God is calling Israel, but he's also uh, warning her that he's about to punish her. Uh, but again, there's hope at the end of this because he is going to uh, woo her back. Verse 16. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband and no longer call me my bow. For I will remove the names of the bowels from her mouth and they shall be remembered by name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow, the sword, and the war from the land, and I will make you lie down in safety. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And in that day, I will answer, declares the Lord. I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth. And the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, and the oil, and they shall answer Jezreel. And I will, sh I will sow her for myself in the land, and I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to my people, or excuse me, I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. <clears throat> and so ultimately, we see a reversal here, uh, again, from the Bible Knowledge Commentary. The nation called Lo Ruhama and Lo Ami will experience God's compassion and will be addressed as his people. He will acknowledge, excuse me, they will acknowledge that he, not Baal, is their God. In chapter three, and the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisin, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethek of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord and his, to his goodness in the latter days. Again, uh, there's just a note here on the, on the bottom talking about uh, why God has called Hosea to this. Uh, here God calls Hosea to live out verses 2, 14 through 20 by wooing back his wife to him once more in order to restore a proper relationship. This is a contextualization of what God has promised to do for Israel in the future. And just before we move on to section two, I want to talk a little bit about a debate that goes on in scholarly circles. <clears throat> and the debate is really whether to take uh, this Hosea story as history or as a vision that Hosea is having. So I'll read here a little bit from the survey of the Old Testament. Hosea's marriage to the prostitute Gomer at the command of God has prompted a variety of interpretive opinions among biblical scholars. The several views concerning the prophet's marriage can be summarized thus. First, a symbolic marriage, that it's allegory and not historical at all. Uh, could be seen as a vision that was given to Hosea. Number two, one literal sequential marriage. Hosea was married to only Gomer, and then chapters one and chapter three are separate events. There's one literal parallel marriage. So here, Hosea was married only to Gomer, and chapters one and chapters three are parallel, telling, me, parallel tellings of the same event. And then finally, uh, the fourth option, two literal marriages, that Hosea was married to Gomer in chapter one, and then another prostitute in chapter three. They go on to say that the best interpretive options, in our opinion, remains the view that holds to one literal marriage for Hosea to a prostituting woman named Gomer, with chapters one and chapters three treating two separate events in the prophet's life. 
she was not only an unchaste bride, but also proved promiscuous as a wife. And then I have a note here to the left, understanding this as a historical event in which Hosea marries a prostitute and then must woo her back from unfaithfulness, best parallels the story of Yahweh and his adulterous wife, Israel. Additionally, it is not unusual for Yahweh to use a prophet to relay prophecy both orally and physically. Note that uh, in Isaiah chapter 20, Isaiah was naked for three years, or that in Ezekiel chapter 4, Ezekiel had to lay on his side for 390 days. So, in my opinion, I feel that this is the best way to view the story. Let's move on to the third section. So we come to a large section of accusations, warnings, and promises. And so we'll kind of go through the, the highlights of that. Chapter four starts with legal proceedings against Israel, then adultery in high places, appeal, return, and be raised. Let's look at that. Chapter five, verse 15. I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. And in their distress, earnestly seek me. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, that he may heal us. He has struck us down, that he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live before him. We get to a section on transgressors of the covenant. And we get a section of similes for Israel, oven, cake, dove, and bow, Israel's hypocrisy, warnings, no worship in a foreign land, and more similes for Israel, grapes, vine, calf, and toddler. Uh, just a note here to the left, Hosea warns Israel of their coming punishment. That's what he's doing in this section. Ephraim has not kept its portion of the covenant with Yahweh and now will endure the wrath of God. <clears throat> Let's look at chapter 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I who took a frame to walk. I took them up by their arms. And they did not know that I had healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love. And I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws. And I bent down and to them and fed them. But they shall not return to the land of Egypt. But Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword shall rage against their cities, consume the bars of their gates, and devour them because of their own counsels. My people are bent on turning from me, and though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I give you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. They shall go after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children shall come trembling from the west, and they shall come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria. And I will return them to their homes, declares the Lord. Ephraim has surrounded me with lies and the house of Israel with deceit, but Judah still walks with God and is faithful to the Holy One. <clears throat> so a couple notes here on the left as to uh, a reminder who Adma and Zeboim are. These are two cities who are amongst the cities in the plain that were destroyed during the reigning of sulfur uh, on Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, and so here God is saying, that he is not going to fully destroy Ephraim or Israel. He's going to punish them, yes. But again, with the hope, he's going to call them back and return them to their homes at some point in the future. We then continue with our 
survey through the third section. Uh, there's a section on dependence upon allies. Uh, they had depended upon Assyria and uh, later uh, tried to uh, lean on Egypt as well, who was also conquered by Assyria. Uh, then there's further indictment based on historical review, worship of man-made gods, rejecting the only hope that they have, and finally closing appeals. And so we come to the end of the book of Hosea. And this is where we leave it off. If Ephraim does not repent, the northern kingdom of Israel, also known as Ephraim, does not repent and is conquered by Assyria in 722 BC. The Assyrians remove most Israelites from Israel and disperse them throughout the Assyrian kingdom, thus destroying their cults and forcing them to give up much of their cultural identity. So if you see the map here, you'll see that this is the area that's ultimately controlled by the Assyrian Empire before they are conquered by the Babylonians. Uh, and you'll see how, how far they control, uh, except for this little area that's in green, where later on Judah becomes a tributary to them. Uh, they are still ruled by themselves, but they have to pay tribute to Assyria so as not to be conquered, uh, and later God would rescue them from Assyria also. However, uh, seeing how big this kingdom is, what Assyria does is they take the people out of Israel. So you can see the little area here that's Israel above, above the green area. This whole area here gets dispersed throughout their entire kingdom. And they put a, a few people here and a few people there. And the reason they do this is so they can destroy all of their cultural identity and make the people uh, bring themselves into the Assyrian culture. Rather than having their own cultural identities, they have to learn to assimilate into an Assyrian culture. Uh, so this does two things. It, it provides more peace in the Assyrian uh, kingdom, uh, but it also uh, doesn't leave a lot of room for people to rise up against them because they have mixed cultural identities. And finally, the ending of Hosea's story. As with our other prophets, uh, the end of Hosea's story is not recorded in the book itself in the Bible, uh, but Jewish tradition of Hosea's life is included in the pseudepigraphic work, The Lives of the Prophets, and his death is also recorded uh, in the 13th century book, The Book of the Bee. Uh, what you'll notice here is that these are almost exactly the same, and so likely the Book of Bee draws its information from the lives of the prophets in this scenario. Let's see what the lives of the prophets has to say. Hosea was from Baalameth of the tribe of Issachar, and he prophesied and spoke and gave signs that when Christ comes to upon the earth, the oak that is in Shiloh shall be divided of its own accord into 12 parts. After the likeness of the 12 tribes, he chose and took for himself 12 disciples from Israel, and the world was helped by them. And he prophesied 70 years and before Christ in the body, 700 years, and he died and was buried in his own land. <clears throat> uh, again, same thing from the book of the bee, Hosea, the son of Biri from the tribe of Issachar was from the town Bel Alamath. He prophesied mystically about our Lord Jesus Christ, who was to come saying that when he should be born, the oak in Shiloh should be divided in 12 parts and that he should take 12 disciples of Israel. He died in peace and was buried in his own land. So once again, these are pseudepigraphic works. This is not information that they gleaned from the Bible, but rather they're pulling it from other sources, possibly church traditions, possibly other pseudepigraphic works, uh, and assembling this information. So uh, this is the only glimpse we have into the ending of Hosea's story. Uh, and again, we have a prophet who uh, seems to have died naturally and was not murdered. Uh, which is unusual among our prophets, uh, but that's the end of Hosea's story. If you have any questions, we'd love to hear them. Please post down below. Thank you for joining us and have a great day.